So, uh, good morning, everyone. Hi, guys. So, the professor is not going to be joining us until Monday. And uh, before we start with the lecture, uh, let's get done with the logistics. So, how is homework one going? Are you done with the part one yet? No. no. Have you at least started part two? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so where, where exactly are you stuck uh, in part one? It's running out of GPU RAM. Part one? Part one doesn't require the GPU. Oh, I'm talking about part one. Okay. Yeah. So, what do you mean by part two running out of GPU? Like, you have your AWS instance, right? Yeah. And, uh, P2X large should be sufficient to get through A for the homework. Yeah, even if you load it, you should be able to do it. Like it's just a 3 GB data set, right? But when you add the context, if it's a large context, it goes up to like 60 So probably you should be looking at how you're uh, batching. Uh, you should not be taking the entire data set at once, but uh, just just make sure that you only have the required. Uh, data that you're training on on the GPU at, at that time. You don't have to run through the entire data to train it. So so we, we can make a post on it, but apart from it, uh, do you have any other problems? The, I mean, the batch norm specification took so long just to figure out because the assignment was really described like how that should work. Okay. So actually, uh, batch norm was scheduled to be uh, today's lecture, but since uh, most of you coming here already have that background, we kind of thought we can just give you a derivation and you could implement it. Yeah, just like maybe like a description of where it should fit in. It's not even clear that hmm. some of the art supposed to help. Like, no, like not for the lecture, but... Okay, so, so, so exactly uh, for this reason, we extended the initial deadline. We don't have uh, the 21st deadline right now. You can submit it up to 24th. Uh, so, so both parts. Yeah, exactly. So right. you, you got three extra days for it. I think it's fair. Right? Yes. So initially, the deadline for homework one part one was 21st. Now it is uh, 24th. You don't have the early submission deadline. You said homework part one is 24th. I'm sorry? You said homework part one goes back to 24th. Yes. Both parts on 24th. So it's due. So right now we have part one due on 24th. Yes. Midnight? Yeah. <laughs> uh, both part one and part two are due on 24th. Okay. So we, we, we're going to be talking about optimization today. This lecture will be particularly important because you just started working on your part two and uh, le learning some tricks on how you can make your network con converge faster would really be beneficial. So a quick re recap. So we've looked into how gradient descent works, the back prop, the forward prop, use a divergence function to compare your the obtained outputs with the expected outputs, and then you propagate that error back through the network. And then you, uh, min you try to minimize the function by uh, updating the weights and biases. And finally, you, you keep iterating the training until you get an approximate function which gives you optimal results. So uh, one of the issues that we encountered was when you, when you use a converge, when you, when you try to train your network and you have a fixed learning rate, uh, the, the step size is really important, right? Th there is a chance that your network starts uh, diverging because you have a fixed size and you have a lot of dimensions to train on. So it might be possible that a step size that is good enough for a dimension in x is not good enough for a dimension in y. So, for that, uh, we talked about momentum methods where we uh, keep a track of uh, all the gradients that we have from the past. So we, we keep tracking the gradients, and based on the running average, we take our step, uh, next steps. We, we spoke about the Nistrov uh, gradient method, wherein you look ahead. You, if, you, if you're in a state currently, you look, you look ahead, you see what the di gradient is, and then based on that gradient, you take a sum of the vectors and you go in that direction. So this is a smarter way, but it doesn't really work in every case. So topics for the day is uh, we'll be talking about different ways in which we can train on neural network. Uh, basically, the, the way you can sample it, uh, so stochastic gradient descent, where you can just sample using a sing uh, 
single samples and you can go through the entire data set, updating one sample at a time. And then you have your batch gradient descent where you just take the entire data set as a batch and you update all of those samples. There are four of the samples. And then you have your uh, mini batch gradient descent where you take small batches and you make uh, incremental updates to your weights. So this has uh, proven to give us better results. We'll look into why. So firstly, what, 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 what exactly are we training? So we have, suppose we have a function y equals f of x. We, we are trying to model the function f. So we have the inputs x and we have the outputs y. So the function can be uh, estimated to look like this. This might be the optimal. This, uh, anyways, are two dimensional. But suppose it looks like this. So initially, when you uh, initialize your random weights, you can assume your function looks like this. So all you have to do is try to fit this red curve into the blue curve. You have to minimize the error, the, the area that is between these. So how you can think of it is uh, you, you have a cloth, and you have a cloth, and you're trying to shape that cloth into a certain shape. You, you can pick points, and you can pull and push points below until you have the most approximate uh, representation of the function you're looking for. So this is how you can keep updating it. So uh, how does number of samples affect this? So if, if you're trying to uh, update the function using a single sample, so you, you'll be picking one uh, point. You'll be picking at one point, right? So it, it's really sparse. But in, in order to uh, approximate a function, you, need, you really need to have a lot of samples so that you, have, uh, you don't have to approximate any curve between two samples. Are you following me? Is that fine? Thank you. Okay. So see, these are the points. You hold one point at a time. This uh, basically uh, shows how stochastic gradient descent works. You update one sample at a time. You pull one point uh, on the function up or push it down uh, at, at a single time. As you can see, this might be a really slow process because you have to iterate through the entire data set to have one epoch. So th that is the reason we look into uh, methods like batch and mini batch gradient descents. So uh, random randomization, why, why do we have to randomize data before we uh, train the network? So there have been a couple posts on Piazza where people ask us, uh, why do I have to have an IID, uh, statistically independent uh, samples. So basically, if you have, if you're, if you're sampling through the data set exactly the same way every time, what happens is th there is a probability that you uh, have a cyclic behavior for the network. So you, you, you update the ne network exactly the same way every, every single time. So when you're updating it the first time, the network optimizes here. And when, when you get to the end, it slowly moves away. So th this kind of uh, gives rise to a cyclic behavior, which is not uh, right, because the network always remembers the last update that you made to the network, the latest updates. That, that's the reason we have to go through it randomly. That's it, right? So if you, if you keep moving on a forward pass and you update it, it looks like this. And when you, when you keep iterating it, it just uh, exhibits the same behavior again and again. So uh, l let's take another example to differentiate between stochastic and uh, batch gradient descent. Yeah. So uh, the network doesn't really learn any new things. It just keeps moving between uh, the same uh, function. So initially, it learns some behavior. And then when you move through the samples, it learns another behavior. And when you have the same thing again and again, it sort of overfits and doesn't learn anything new. So it moves between predicting the samples that you initially gave and then the samples that you uh, gave to the network towards the end. So if, if you randomize the network, there is a high probability that you have a more approximate curve. We'll get to that in a while. So yeah, so the difference between a batch and a stochastic gradient different, uh, descent. So what happens is, yeah. So you're saying that this incremental update is for stochastic gradient descent? No, uh, incremental updates is updating the network uh, in steps. So st gradient descent is just a concept. Stochastic is taking one sample at a time. So we'll just get to that in a second. <laughs> 
Yeah, so what happens when you uh, try to train the network with a batch is uh, you have the gradients of all the weights so basic, all, all this, uh, for all instances. And then you try to average based on all of those uh, gradients and you move in the direction which is average, right? Whereas if you have a single sample, you move in the direction which, optim uh, which makes the network learn only that single sample. So for, uh, yeah. So for, for uh, <clears throat> in, in a case where all of those samples are unfortunately the same, suppose you took a sampling where all of those samples are very similar to each other. So a stochastic gradient descent will be updating the network t times. So if you have t samples, you have to iterate and update it t times, right? Whereas uh, in a batch gradient descent, you, you just have to update it once. You take the average of all the uh, gradients that you have for different instances, and you update it once. So batch gradient descent is, uh, is way faster than stochastic gradient descent. But uh, there are a few differences. We'll get to that. <clears throat> So you see, uh, we, we a batch gradient descent basically updates it in a single go, and SDD takes t computations to do the same thing. This also works with uh, data which is uh, very similar. You don't have to have the exactly uh, exactly the same data to do it. If this, uh, the data is slightly different, this still applies because the gradient is still going to be in the same direction. Okay. So uh, learning rate. So how do you choose the learning rate? So if, if you have a learning rate which is way too small, the network never converges, right? So you're always stuck in optimizing those little steps that you never get to the optimum. But if you have a large learning rate, the let network tends to become divergent. So it never gets to the optimum because the step size is too big. So here, there is another issue. Yeah, so the learning rate also depends on how accurate uh, your network is at classification. So if your learning rate is too high, the network always tries to uh, minimize the error in a way that uh, all of those samples are, I'm sorry, uh, if, if, you, if you have a smaller learning rate, all of these samples are very well uh, classified. So it, it, it is kind of uh, a bit of overfitting, but we'll look into it. So uh, stochastic gradient descent, how, we, we, we just spoke about how the step size is uh, a big factor in teaching the network uh, how to model the function. So basically, uh, there, there have been a lot of studies where the optimal comes down to this. So the, the learning rate should be inversely proportional to the number of iterations that are taking place in the training. So if, if, you, are, if you are training the network for, from, from a point over 10 epochs or something like that. So initially, you start with the larger learning rate, and you keep decaying it until a point where you don't have to worry about the, the learning rate too, uh, being too big to step out of the, I mean, uh, the, the training becoming divergent. So th there are two conditions for this. Firstly, uh, you should be able to explore the entire space. So the learning rate should not be bounded. You should be able to move around freely. But at the same time, it should be convergent. So that uh, explains the first two. Uh, Equations here, firstly, the summation should be uh, infinite. That is, you can explore the space and look into different uh, areas where you can look, where the network can find an optimal. And then uh, the network should be convergent. So uh, looking at this graph, this graph basically tells you how uh, well different networks converge. So the red line uh, shows uh, stochastic gradient descent, the convergence, and the vertical lines shows the variance. You, you can clearly see that uh, stochastic gradient descent is very quick at updates, but at the same time, it doesn't really converge to an optimal. Like, you can uh, pick some really uh, hand-picked, cherry-picked example and so, show that uh, SDD works better, but it, it is not true in all cases. So people usually uh, tend to go with batch gradient descents because mini-batch or gr grouping uh, gradient descents basically because uh, it is more stable. Uh, you, you do an update over a large uh, samples, whereas stochastic gradient descent, you'll keep updating the network individu at ind individual points. Mm -hmm. Question? Yeah. So in this graph, every vertical line uh, we basically a convergence here. I'm sorry? In, in this graph, it does every vertical line represent a No, the vertical lines uh, represent the variance. Uh, the curve represents the convergence. Uh, okay. So it is the error versus the training time. So how long does it take for the network to converge? 
So uh, when we talk about the function, how when we talk about modeling it, uh, we we kind of assume that the number of samples we have tend to give us an approximate, a really good approximate of the function that we are trying to model. But it is not really that case, obviously, because the function has too many sample points, and you just can't uh, do all of it. For example, if you if you are uh, trying to uh, teach a network to classify images, MNIST dataset, you have what 784 dimensions. And each dimension can hold up to what 256 values. So it is 256 power 784 values that you have to sample to get the perfect function. But that's not the case. That's uh, really difficult to do. Therefore, we have an empirical risk involved. You you basically uh, uh, tend to look at the expected value of the uh, error function, the divergence. So you you run a lot of iterations. You get the average, and you Tend to, tend to say that the average uh, shows the approximate uh, function that you're trying to model. Yeah, so why, why do we uh, care so much about the number of samples again? So the variance is inversely proportional to the number of samples here. So if you have a lot of samples, the variance is low. If you have few samples, the variance is going to be high. So any small changes in the uh, training can make uh, a lot of uh, effect, can have a lot of impact on the model function. So having a lot of samples makes it easier for you to uh, be sure about how approximate or how good your model is. Yeah, so, <clears throat> so what exactly do we mean by error? So let's look at two of these uh, graphs. Blue, blue is a curve that we are trying to, blue is a function, blue line is a function that we are trying to model, and red is where we are. So the area that is in between these uh, curves is the error. So basically what we are trying to do is we are trying to reduce the error in between these by using the sample. So you have a sample, you, you sample at different spots, and uh, you try to move in a direction where the error is minimized. Yeah, so basically having more samples, again, it's, it's the same thing. Having more samples uh, uh, would, would lead to a better training, and you'll have much more confidence in saying that your model is approximate to the model that you're trying to uh, produce. <clears throat> So if you, if you have a single sample or very few samples, any update to the function with these samples is going to sway the entire network in different directions, right? So you, do, you don't have, so, so suppose you have this function, you have a sample here and you have a sample here. So everything in between that sample is approximated. So if you have more samples, you don't have to approximate it. You, 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 you know exactly what the network should output at those inputs. So you, you don't have to just extrapolate anything in between those samples. So we, we spoke about uh, stochastic gradient descent and the uh, batch gradient descent, but there is another uh, method which is called the mini batch gradient descent, that w which, which is what we uh, all use. Basically, this is a, more, a, a smaller version of the batch gradient descent. Basically, we, we take in a s small set of samples, and then we keep uh, training, iteratively training the network on these. So what, what happens is the, the sample that you took is a uh, random sampling, and basically this is supposed to uh, give a random, this is supposed to represent a random distribution of the data set that you already have. Which is not the case, but yeah, that, that is the concept. So you, you have a random distribution of your data set, and you, to, you pick small samples randomly, which, uh, is the expect, which should be the expected value of the random distribution. But once you, uh, when you keep iteratively training it, you can expect that the network learns multiple positions at the same time. And you, when, when, you, when you do it enough times, then you have a really good approximation of the model that you're looking for. Any questions? Could you please uh, explain that figure a little bit, a little bit more? Uh, these? Uh, yellow, yellow rectangle means. Oh, it, it, it's just uh, highlighting the update. So at this time step, you're basically updating three spots. <clears throat> 
So you have a random distribution, right? You have a mini batch. You you took random samples in those uh, fr from your entire data set. You took some random samples and formed a mini batch from it, and you update the network at these spots. So basically, when you're updating the network randomly, it when you, when you do it iteratively, eventually you end up having a nice approximation of the model function you're looking for, right? Yeah. The blue line, the blue line is the true function that you're trying to uh, model. The red line is uh, so basically the red lines signify, uh, signify the changes that are happening with the updates. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so do the chosen subsets do they have to be disjoint and like be like total up to the training set? Yes. So basically, when we are sampling data from the data set, the training set. We uh, ideally would want the data to be statistically independent. There is no dependencies between the data, and they are completely random. So you keep doing that iteratively. You pick random samples over many times, and you keep training the data, and eventually you end up with the approximate function. Yeah. So um, why like, is mini batch better than the whole batch of like, So whole batch, uh, firstly, it is computationally expensive. It takes a long time to compute all of that, and uh, secondly. It's like you're trying to uh, train the entire network at once. You're trying, so the handkerchief example that I've given, you have a function, you're trying to pick points there, push points down. What if you try to pick all of those points at once? So this is like a synchronous update, and you, you, you're not really factoring the updates given by other samples before you uh, update from different samples, right? It's like, hmm. So if you update all of the points at once, it seems like, not an optimal solution, right? You're, you're trying to pull all of those points up at once. So if, if, you, if you keep updating it in batches randomly distributed, so it kind of gets, uh, tends to give you a better convergence. Let's see. Yeah. So one, one of the biggest reasons is it's computationally really expensive. It takes a long time to get through a network. I can't hear you. Huh? I can't hear you. Uh, so it's for a mini batch algorithm, make it easier to parallelize the L computation, or? Hmm. So the computation is anyways uh, parallelized in the GPU. But one of the biggest uh, problems I see with the batch uh, update is basically if your data set is too large, you can't run it through your GPU. So you, it's, it's impossible for you to run an entire, it, so in the next assignment, you'll be probably working with 60 GB of data. So how would you fit in 60 GB of data on the GPU? You can't, right? So basically, mini batch works. You can take small samples randomly, and then you can keep updating your data set. So this is uh, the convergence graph for different uh, methods. That is a SDD, mini batch, and the batch gradient descent. As you can see, there is not much difference between the convergence of a batch and mini batch gradient descent, except that this is way faster than the batch because of uh, smaller sample size. Yeah, another thing is in, in, in a mini batch gradient descent, you have uh, smaller samples which represent your entire data set. So they, they are picked randomly. So I think that is also one of the causes for it to converge very fast. So you don't have to have a lot of samples to represent your data set. You can have a small, small number of samples and you can keep doing it iteratively until you get uh, the final function. Yeah, so we, we spoke about uh, convergence. We, the, firstly, having a fixed uh, uh, learning rate is not going to help because it's going to diverge some point. <laughs> what, what is optimal at one state of uh, training is not going to be optimal at the final state. So you, you have to find a way to keep updating and changing the learning rate so that every dimension can uh, converge correctly. So the, w one way is to keep uh, decaying the learning rate with the uh, number of iterations that are happening. So we, we spoke about how uh, we, we can, how the learning rate can be decayed by inverse proportionality relation with the number of iterations. And then uh, we will be speaking about some adaptive methods, uh, add a grad, add a grade, Adam, and other 
ways in which we can optimize, in which we can train the networks. So uh, in, in our last class, we spoke about momentum, where we, use, we keep a running average of uh, all the gradients that we have in the past for every dimension. And then based on those updates, we decide whether uh, we have to take uh, we, we have to update uh, in that direction or not. For example, if the network has been having a, ha having the same uh, gradient, or if the gradient is, hasn't been uh, changing directions uh, very often, so you, you can increase the momentum in that direction, because there is still time until uh, the, net, uh, the dimension or the weight uh, changes, it, the gradient changes its uh, sign, right? I'm sorry, uh, did I explain it correctly? Did you get it? I'm sorry. <laughs> so here you can see that uh, the state initially, it, it is trying to move towards the optimum. So you, you can see it as two dimensions. You have an x and a y. So it doesn't really make sense if you uh, update a lot in the y direction because your gradient is mostly towards the x. So here your uh, learning rate increases in the x direction, whereas in the y, because if by increasing it, you, you will be uh, Losing momentum, I guess. You you'll not be updating in those directions. Yeah, this is what I was trying to describe. So, in in the y direction, there is a lot of movement. Therefore, uh, there is little momentum because the gradient has been shifting. And then in the x direction, the gradient has been pretty stable. So th there's a lot of momentum, and you can increase your learning rate in that direction. And then we spoke about Nesterov's uh, gradient, accelerated gradient, where you take a step ahead, look what the uh, look how the gradient is, and then based on the gradient uh, in the new state, you take a sum of vectors and you move in that direction. This this can also be applied to the incremental updates. So uh, more recent methods have. Uh, been uh, into understanding how the gradient shifts work and how we could use those the, the information that we get from the change in gradients, the directions, uh, to improve the learning rate, uh, to improve the learning. So Adam is very popular in this uh, practice. RMS prop is what we are going to be talking about, uh, root mean square. And then all of these are basically versions of RMS prop, so we won't be looking into the other, other ones. Yeah, so the, the whole point, again, comes down to this, to uh, decrease the uh, oscillations and just smoothen the convergence towards the optimum. So uh, one of the ways is uh, RMS prop, wherein you just uh, take the gradient, and then you square it. Uh, then the mean squared expectation of this uh, gradient gives us the running estimate. And ba based on this, uh, we know if uh, the, the network is uh, diverging or if the network is converging to a spot. So, <clears throat> so if, if there has been a lot of oscillations in one dimension, you basically don't uh, uh, move, move in that direction. Where, and if there is uh, little, little oscillation, then you probably just move in that direction. Yeah, so this, this uh, visualization gives us an approximate, tells us how each of these uh, convergence methods work. So SED, as you can see, is very slow in converging to the optimal, whereas uh, the other momentum methods and energy pretty much uh, get there as quickly as possible. So there have been different ways. So this doesn't mean that SJD never works. It's just that in this case, SJD is very slow to converge, but sometimes SJD tends to work. So you, you have to uh, run it. You, you have to try it. It, it. It's completely empirical. Whatever works for you is going to work. And this is how uh, it works in a saddle point. You see, SGD takes forever to converge. So you, you, you can think about something here. So SGD is slow, right? So it, it, is, it might not be uh, 
correct to use SGD from the start. So you can probably just use an Atom in the beginning, and when your network stops converging, you can just switch with an SGD and with a very low learning rate and see if can if you can improve your results with it. Yeah. Yeah, we, we have a lower. I'm sorry? I, I mean, while the SPD, like each step it takes is very small. Yes. But, but, uh, but well, we can achieve like a, I can understand mm. like SPD's direction is kind of noisy, but uh, this, this one is just so, you move slowly. Hmm. Uh, I'm not really sure of what the parameters, what, what the uh, learning rate was when they were doing it. but. It, it, it actually signifies how each of these networks work. SGD is usually slow when you're uh, running it with, training your networks with it. So is the idea that SGD is slow because it never like, it doesn't recognize that the gradient's still increasing in the same direction and accelerates work? So uh, you, you can look at SGD as a very uh, naive al algorithm. It just keeps shooting at the uh, minimum. So. so you see? Uh, here, SGD is stuck in a local minima. So that is because it is not looking for anything else. So I don't think it will ever <laughs> get out of that place. Yeah. But yeah, SGD 10. recognize that the gradient's decreasing more in some certain direction or some other heuristic stuff moving So you can also uh, attribute it to this, right? So because the learning rate is fixed, no matter what you do, how, how fast you move, sometime. You, you get into a local minima, you can't get out of it. So there is no way for you to uh, move out of local minimas because you're always shooting towards, uh, you, you're always shooting with the learn, fixed learning rates. Sure. So if, if you have a learning rate which is adaptive, which keeps changing, then probably you can start off with a larger learning rate, explore areas, and then move into a global minima, I guess. I'm sorry? I mean, the best size here. The best size? Uh, when computing like the gradient for the momentum, is it only use the one sample to compute the gradient or a mini, mini batch size? Uh, I'm not really sure what they used, but you, you can expect similar results. It, it doesn't really uh, matter. The convergence is not really dependent on the algorithm that you're using, whereas the yeah, so the convergent is dependent on the algorithm you're, that you're using, whereas the variance is dependent on the sample size. Yeah, because the reason why I ask curious about it is that uh, other algorithms have the right direction, other, all, while SPD don't have the direction. Yeah, so it is stuck in the local minima, right? Yeah. So it is not trying to explore areas. So how, why this um, method can get rid of the local minima? So I think I'll just have to refer to that paper to see what parameters he used. <laughs> Can't really answer without it. So, but but you still get the idea, right? What what uh, happens? Just for intuition, if if you ever feel that your network is stuck in a lo local uh, minima, you can probably st try changing your uh, uh, the method that you're trying to use. E either use an Adam or another optimizer to see how it works. So, uh, so the the whole point of uh, optimization here, the class here, is basically to help you with uh, homework part two. So the divergence. So how how, how do you decide what divergence to use? So the, the network is converging based on the error, right? So the error is pro back propagated through the entire network. So what loss function is optimal for your network is one of the questions that you will be you should be uh, looking into. And also, uh, what kind of uh, function are you looking at? So w which ones do you think is a better function to model? I mean, w better function to optimize? Is it, obviously, this one has a lot of uh, local minimas, and this one has a global minima, but it is steep. Any, any, any uh, function with a steep uh, gradient uh, near the minimas is not really uh, uh, good. And then we, we should be aiming at uh, having a smooth I mean, we should be looking at having a smooth uh, function. Uh, 
which helps us uh, having a nice divergence. Steep gradients is usually bad. Smooth curves is really, usually good. That's the intuition that you have to take from this. So again, what, what happens if you have a steep curve is, suppose you're using an SDD, you have a fixed learning rate, you just get into it, you overshoot and you get out of it. So th there is no way, or it, it is really difficult for you to converge to an optimum. Whereas if you have a smooth curve, it is very easy for you to get down. So the most common uh, functions that we use for loss, d for divergence are L2 and the KL, callback uh, Leibman, KL divergence. So L L2 divergence is basically used for uh, uh, numerical prediction so you, you have you, you are trying to predict values like uh, linear regression or maybe so then l2 works and kl divergence works uh, very well for uh, classification methods because it basically deals with uh, probabilistic outputs yeah so here here comp comparing l2 and the kl divergence which one do you think is uh, a better function so both of them have a local bo both of them have a global optima but as you can see, L2 divergence has a steep uh, gradient uh, just, just close to the uh, minimum, whereas the uh, KL divergence has a really nice smooth curve before it gets to the uh, minimum. So uh, everyone has implemented batch norms, right? So while implementing, have you ever thought about visualizing what effects that batch term is having on the data? So let's let's look at uh, mini batch updates. So as you, this is what we are trying to. Uh, so we, we we are assuming that the mini mini batches have a very similar distribution. So each of these colored uh, blobs, assume each of these colored blobs are mini batches, is a mini batch, but. Usually, that is not the case. So it's, it's not really random. Uh, even though you are picking those samples randomly, there's always some biases uh, inside that. So it is not uh, very well distributed. So this is more or less what you can expect. Your data, each of your mini batch has variances inside them. So it's, it's not very similar to each other. And this is the worst case. You can, you can have completely different samples in each of, the, in each of your mini batches. So, what we try to do here is we, we try to normalize the data that we have. So each mini batch should more or less uh, be similar to other mini batches. This is because uh, you, you want the network to learn from very similar things. It should be random, but it should have uh, very similar mm, similar data. Yeah. So basically, what you do is you try to mean all the data. You try to uh, get center the data. It's, it's basically called a zero mean method. Yeah. So you just subtract the mean and you divide uh, the data with the standard deviation, the, the variance. So this is what you should be expecting. This is uh, an ideal uh, <coughs> representation of mini batches. So you, you don't have any biases inside them. A mini batch is uh, really nice. I mean, the, it, it is zero mean. You, you don't have a separate uh, mean for each of them. And then you scale and shift it. So this is also called a covariate, covariate shift. This is to, again, normalize the data that you have so that the network uh, is trained correctly. So, uh, yeah. Where do we move the data to? Like yeah, so it, it is called scaling and shifting. Uh, we'll just get to that in a second. So you don't know exactly where to move it. You, that is another parameter that the network is going to learn. So batch norm has all of these parameters. When you're implementing it, all of it is being learned. So you, you don't know it when the training starts. So ideally, where do you think the batch norm should go now? Before activation, right? Obviously, because you you want uh, you don't want any uh, additional factors to influence. To, to creep up after your activation. So you basically zero mean it, you, you use batch norm, and then you pass your outputs after batch norm into your activation layers. And you don't do it uh, in the final layer, you only do it for the layers before it, because the final layer is basically uh, a logics layer which gives you the probability, probability distribution of the outputs. So uh, again, so batch normalization has two parts. The first part is uh, zero mean and uh, 
zero mean and shifting, scaling and shifting. Hmm. Sorry, the first part is only zero mean and you stand, you normalize it, and the second part is scaling and shifting. So this is uh, what you do. You use a covariate, covariate shift to the standard position, and then you have your uh, scaling and shifting, what we just saw. So this is what happens in the first part. You, you have your covariate shift. You uh, normalize it with your standard deviation, and then you scale your batches, and then you shift it. And then, obviously, you, you do it for your entire uh, batch. So your variance becomes your summation over the batch divided by it, and also the mean changes. So uh, two parts again, right? Firstly, we are introducing two variables here. Gamma is your scaling factor. So basically, you have your mini batch. You have to move it somewhere. So how, how would you decide how much to scale it? And then you have your uh, beta, which is uh, basically telling where to move it, so the, the shifting uh, factor that we're using. So uh, how do we do uh, back propagation through batch norm? So the first part is very simple. You have your outputs. You have your divergence function, change in divergence with respect to your output, and then it keep, just keep back propagating, and then you have your change in divergence with respect to z. And what gets interesting is what happens inside this. So uh, the first part, I mean, the second part of the batch sum is pretty easy. You just have to do the divergence, the change in divergence with respect to the shift factor and the scaling factor. It, it comes in very directly from this. Just differentiate, and you get those outputs. Whereas the first part is a bit more complex. How would, you, uh, how would you know the change in divergence with respect to z? Right. So, so z is influencing not only uh, the covariant shift, but also u. So yeah. So you can see z, uh, the mean, the variance, and the output from the first part of the batch sum is dependent on the z. So therefore, you, that, all of that should be factored into the back, back propagation. So this uh, gives you the final uh, equation. And I'm sure everyone has already implemented it. Yes? Um, what's u sub b and u i? Sorry? In this influence diagram, what, what are those? Uh, mu, mu is the mean. The yeah, mean. U i, is that the normal? U is the output from the covariate shift. So you have the two parts, right? You have the covariate shift in the first one, then the output from it, and then you oh, right. yeah, yeah. do a scaling so that's and shifting. X in the, sorry. Sort of. <coughs> sorry? Sorry, did you say sort of? Uh, so, that, <laughs> so that is the output from the first part of batch norm. Yeah, before you scale it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah so it, Yes. Yeah, Sorry, I'm not dealing with part one, so. So uh, another thing with batch norm is you, you don't, uh, you, don't you, you freeze uh, the variables that you've learned during the training, by, and you don't uh, change them during inference. You just assume that that is your mean, and those are the covariant shift and your uh, scaling and shifting factors that you're going to use for your entire data set. You assume that the incoming data also has similar characteristics, and then you don't have to retrain it. Yeah. So um, I was looking over last year's slides and trying to implement batch norm in my homework. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't feel like the alpha update that we used in the homework is the same as this. I'm sure it is. I'm just, could you explain how this is similar to the, the homework? 
average of the mean and variance. Yeah, so, but is this a, is this a different method? We used like the previous running mean multiplied by alpha times the current mean multiplied by one minus alpha in order to do our update for the running mean. Is it the well, same as this? We're not doing that here. Yeah, we're not doing that here. So, we put red, you know. It, uh, that's, that's mostly the question is, is it the same? Like, is this step equivalent to what we were doing? This is like almost saving all of the means and then taking the average of them across all of our iterations. Uh, we'll, we'll just clarify this on Piazza. Probably okay. just talk to Professor. Okay. Okay. So uh, the results with batch norm are typically way better than what you would get without a batch norm. So that is what this uh, graph signifies. <coughs> <laughs> so ev everything that you have seen till now uh, might not be accurately might not, might not be accurate because you you never have the complete uh, sam you 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 cannot you do not you do not have the entire sample set to model the function exactly as it is right so you have some samples there is some overfitting and this is typically what you get if you have very sp uh, if you have a very sparse sample set so you are only training the model at certain samples, so it tends to overfit, and it is not uh, very well extrapolated between the points. So this is the reason we use some uh, smoothening uh, methods. Uh, okay, we'll just get to the smoothing in a minute. So again, I, I just spoke about how uh, we have so many dimensions, so many parameters, and we, need, we would be needing so many samples to train the network accurately, but we don't have those samples. So here is another example. You, suppose you have a 100-dimensional data set, 100-dimensional input data. You have, uh, suppose it is binary. You have 2 power 100 uh, possible inputs. So for, for all of those inputs, you sh if you want to accurately uh, approximate the function, you need all of those samples, right? So you, you don't have all of those samples. You, you basically have a very sparse sample set. And it's very difficult to get uh, good method without using smoothening. So th this can be, th we can think of it like this. You, you gave it a dot, and you're asking the network to approximate a function over it. It's, it's, it's impossible unless you have enough functions. So we can add in a few smoothening constraints, basically, where you tell when the weights are becoming too high. You, you tell the network that the weights are becoming too huge, and you, you add a regularization parameter that doesn't allow the network to uh, increase the weights too much. So the, the parameters, regularization parameters, basically keep the weights in check. So this is the kind of function we want to approximate. So you have your training samples. So we ideally would expect a smooth curve from between all of these samples. But what you get is something very similar to this. This is a classic uh, case of overfitting with a binary classifier. And th this, this can also be uh, said because individual neurons are very good at uh, uh, detecting edges and becomes really difficult for you to, we will get to that in a minute, sorry. So yeah, an another thing is, uh, yeah, so this is where uh, we use the regularization parameters, the lambda. So we basically uh, control the size or the yeah, the size of weights with lambda. So if, if your weights are increasing, the lambda decides whether uh, you, you, you reduce the weights or not. So if, if you have a, a greater lambda, if you have a larger lambda, it, it gives importance to shrinking the weights because in the end, you're still trying to minimize the loss function. If you have a larger lambda, you cannot have, a long, you cannot have, you have bigger weights because having bigger weights would, in the end, mean having a bigger output from the, for the loss function. <laughs> Yeah, so this is uh, pretty much a summary of what the update should look like for the batch stochastic mini batch and the update rule for, this is the stochastic update rule, yeah. So this is a summary of what we've discussed, and we'll probably be just be adding a lambda w at the end. So it's, it's not going to change a lot of, uh, it's, it's not computationally intensive, it's just adding another parameter at the end. <coughs> 
So uh, we can also control the smoothness uh, through the structure of the network. Example, if you have a few layer, if you have a single layer, uh, all the network learns is to draw edges, right? Each 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 uh, perceptron basically can draw a single edge. So deeper representations usually have a much smoother output. For example, let's look at this. Uh, let's look at the results for this. So basically, we are trying to uh, estimate the contours for this. So let's, let's find a better example. Yeah. So you, you have the input shape to the left, and you have 660 units in total. So initially, with three layers, the output is very bad. And then when you keep increasing your layers, the output keeps in improving. So why, why do you think this happens? So, OK, so basically what happens is when you have a stack of layers, when you, when you have layers stacking over one another, uh, layers on top tend to learn much more complicated features as compared to layers at the bottom. So the layers at the bottom can only uh, uh, understand lines, whereas when you keep increasing the depth of it, it tends to learn much more complex features. And here, you can see the output of the bear, which more or less looks like a bear here, and it's just rubbish with three layers. Uh, any doubts here? So uh, I don't think it really depends on uh, the number of units as long as uh, it is not too less. Because if, if, you're, if you're just stacking, so like honestly, I don't think there's a rule for that, having the fixed number of layers, fixed number of units per layer. But uh, the general understanding is that if you keep increasing the depth of layers, you, you, you can model much more complex functions. Do you have anything to add? So I, I usually uh, tend to do this. I first try to overfit the model. Once you know that the model is learning, and then you, I, I keep reducing the number of units per layer to see what works best. So when you say overfit, you mean add more layers? Uh, units. More Both. Units. I mean, it, it, it's all empirical. Whatever works for you should do. And th there is no golden rule uh, telling you to do it in, this, in a certain way. You can just keep trying it until something works. I think that. So uh, we, we we've discussed a couple drop uh, regularization techniques, but one of the most prominent ones that we that have shown to give really good results is the dropouts. So dropout is basically just switching off some units uh, while you're training it, so that the network can learn much more complex represent and much more denser representations. So th this is this is uh, under the understanding that the network has enough capacity again. So if the network is full to capacity, if the network perfectly uh, models your function without having any extra space, then if you switch off the layers, it's not going to work. You need to have extra capacity. You can, yeah. So I can't, and does the dropout, when they say drop out 50% of your units yes. at mm -hmm. a given layer, is it doing that for just that batch size? Or is it changing what neurons it's turning off for each batch? Or is it doing it for the entire epic? So How does that function? The idea is that for each sample that you can forward, treat each unit as a familiar random variable, uh, or sorry, each weight, and you include that weight um, with that, or the, whatever, 50% 50, 50, 50 of the time, flipping a coin with, with a bias for each weight. So it could be changing. And, and we, we are not switching off the weights. We are switching off the entire neuron. So it's not an edge that you're switching off. 
when you turn off a neuron, all of the weights that are coming out of it are gone. So th there are methods where we switch off weights as well, each edges, but we, we're not going to be discussing it. So uh, why, why, why do we think uh, dropout works? So basically, we have this uh, method called backing, where we use an ensemble of uh, classifiers. We use a lot of classifiers. We train it. We propagate it. When, once we get the results, we basically poll, vote, and then we pick the best results, and that is our output. So this tends to give us uh, this short but uh, really good results because we have a lot of different ways in which we are training and a lot of different networks, which might give different answers based on probably uh, random initialization or whatever it is. But this has shown to give us really good results. So this leads to dropouts, where you try to model all of those different networks into one network. So this is the base network that you have. And then you keep dropping off layers, neurons. Drop out 50% of it. And then, yeah, so one network can be represented as three different networks here. That is because you have a different structure for all of them. You're, you're dropping off certain neurons, certain perceptrons. Therefore, it kind of uh, tends to learn a lot of dense uh, func yeah. dense, it, it learns a dense representation of the function, basically. Yeah, so again, it, it's the same thing. So if, if you have uh, n neurons, th there are two power n different ways in which you can uh, model the function, M possibly uh, possible subnetworks. So basically, one network can represent three networks. That, that is what, uh, can, can you put it in different ways? Yeah, so basically when you're dropping off uh, neurons while training, the network uh, tends to learn new ways, new connections in which it can classify or uh, produce results. So this uh, kind of leads to having a much richer probability, uh, much richer uh, pattern density, and it works, it, it tends to work better, work better. So these are typical uh, retel, re results with uh, dropouts and without dropouts. So as you can see, the network performs way better when you have uh, dropouts. So once, once people got to know that uh, dropouts started working, they came out with various versions of it, uh, zone out where uh, so few, few of the units don't, are not updated, and uh, drop connects where edges are dropped, and some, some other methods. In, in the end, it's, it's all the same. You, you still have, you're still trying to learn different representations with the same network. Yeah, some, some other ways in which you can uh, see if your, I mean, stop before your network starts overfitting is by plotting the graphs of uh, validation and training accuracy or error. So basically, if your validation error starts increasing, that means your network started overfitting and you just stop training at that point. So we will be uh, going over how you can do this using TensorBoard in the next recitation. So for now, yeah. This is intuition. Once the validation error starts increasing, you just stop training it. Yeah, and there is uh, another uh, method in which you can uh, regularize. That is uh, gradient clipping. So once your gradients start increasing a lot, probably just getting to infinity, sometimes your networks, uh, when you're training, uh, start giving you zeros as the outputs. That could be because of zeros or infinities as the outputs. That could be because of uh, uh, the gradients increasing uh, exponentially. So what we do is we just have a fixed size theta. So once your gradient increases that value, you just you just clip it. So it's usually taken as five. But yeah, you, you get the intuition, right? If the slope is too much, you just stop uh, increasing the weights anymore. You, you don't go above that. You don't update it when it goes over. Yeah. 
Yeah, are other ways in which you can uh, regularize, this is specifically done when you have a smaller sample set, you, you augment the training data. So if you're trying to learn a function and you feel that you don't have enough samples, you do tricks like rotating it, distorting it a bit, uh, changing the sizes of it. This increases your data set as well as uh, improves the training because each of these different orientations uh, are treated as different samples by the network. So th there are some other ways in which you can improve uh, the training. We'll be speaking about some methods, the ZCA methods in the, in the next recitation. So yeah, so in the end, it's all about normalizing the inputs, uh, making sure the data is as uh, standardized as possible. There are no biases that the samples can induce. So I, I think all of you have already gotten to this point. So initially, you for, to set up any training uh, algorithm to train any algorithm, firstly you need the data set, without the data set you can't really do anything. Then you choose your network architecture, just start somewhere, uh, it's, it's okay if the network seems too big, just see if it is learning, if it is overfitting, if it, if it does then you can start uh, tuning your parameters, you can, you can just decrease the size, see what works, see what doesn't work. Yeah, so you, you can use a deeper networks based on, if you're using it uh, on your personal computer, it depends on your RAM, uh, the GPUs, if you're using it on AWS, it depends on your credits. So just start with the larger network, keep reducing it, see what works. It's all empirical, whatever works for you should, should do. And then you have to choose the right loss function. Uh, start with cross entropy. Are there any other loss functions at work? Just start with it, keep, keep looking into it. Then you sometimes batch, at least for part two, batch num definitely works. Dropouts might or might not work, so you'll have to check that as well. It's important about understanding where dropouts should be placed, so just, just keep trying it. Uh, in, dropouts are usually placed in uh, the starting layers so that you have different connections from start to end, but then it again depends. And uh, optimization algorithm, again, I, I, I spoke about how you can use Adam initially, and once, you, once your training is saturating, once uh, the error doesn't decrease anymore, you can probably start using SGD with a very low uh, learning rate. That, so intuitively, it makes sense, right? SGD is like a naive algorithm. It just keeps hitting towards the goal. So if your training is saturated, that there is nothing more that your atom or whatever uh, optimization that you use is, is going to do, then you can just try it out. If it works, it works. Or else you can just try for something else. And yeah, you just keep tuning your uh, parameters and just keep working until it works. So this is going to be a norm for all of your assignments from now. It's going to be a lot of trial and error <laughs> until you make it. Yeah. So that's about it. That's the class for today. Do you have any questions? Yeah. When you said just like start with a big network. I'm sorry? So, so when you were talking about choosing your network architecture, yeah. right? Yeah, so, so that is my opinion. You can uh, do whatever yeah. you want to, but. Um, do you have like a, what's too big? So in the end, it depends on what you want to do, right? So I, I basically prefer uh, larger networks because I have the GPU resources for it. And uh, I can see 
So, yeah, I have my perfect time. So I don't really mind working it all night. So once I see that the network overfitted, the validation uh, error is increasing and the training error is decreasing, then I know the network is learning something. Then I start chopping off layers, chopping off units to see what works best. Yeah, so, so the validation error starts. Exactly. So that, that's a really good metric to know where you have to stop training it. Thank you.